Good morning. Any questions for me? So the assignment is due today by four o'clock. Uh, I have some appointment in the afternoon at the three o'clock, so I won't be in my office. But you can slip it under uh, the door if you're not able to handle it before that. The exam, second midterm exam, is a week from uh, today. And uh, once again, I will be away at a meeting out of town, but my postdoc will come and administer the test uh, on Tuesday, next Tuesday. So the format will be very similar to what we saw in the first midterm. There is no assignment for this week, and uh, there is no quiz. So study for the exam on your own. And it it will include everything up until what you have seen in the last lecture. Uh, system of linear, nonlinear equations, uh, root finding schemes, uh, the combination of both theory and uh, problem solving. Okay, uh, I, I will put up a sample exam from the past year uh, on that. <coughs> Uh, there will be less of that, um, but there will be uh, fixing of MATLAB code. So when, when you're solving a problem, I say set up the matrix, for example, and then I tell you here is a code that will solve, and there are some errors in there, and uh, fix that, that kind of a question. But not on the what will MATLAB do if you enter this command kind of a thing. Right? I think you guys are getting pretty good at it. We've gone past that stage, I think. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Less than half the class is here. <laughs> is there an exam or something? No. Doing a homework. <laughs> Doing a homework. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, all these excuses, you think? Yeah. Um, today I'm going to start. Uh, the next chapter on a new topic, and that is um, it will build, as you will see, on what we have seen because every problem in uh, computer modeling of mathematical equations is eventually reduced to one of solving a system of linear or nonlinear algebraic equations. Even when we do differential equations, that's what we do. So, th but the problem today that we are going to start is called functional approximation or curve fitting. How many of you are familiar with the idea of a curve fitting? Have you ever done it? No? Even if you have not done it, can you kind of guess what it might mean, curve fitting, what, what, that concept? Exactly, that's what it is. Yeah. O often we have data points that we observe from nature uh, at discrete events, so going back to observation of planets, planetary positions, and stuff like that. We just take data points every few hours, for example, and then we have a trajectory for the moon or a trajectory for various planets, and we try to build a model. And the model should get better and better with time, and that, that's what happened in the case of uh, describing planetary motions from uh, Kepler's law to Newton's law, which is able to precisely predict once we have that data from the past and a model that fits it, you understand the fundamental ideas behind it, the model can then predict forever. But there are situations where the processes are so complex that we cannot build a more fundamental model. By fundamental model, again, I mean one that are based on principles, principles of conservation of momentum, which is Newton's law of motion, conservation of energy, conservation of mass. Um, so those laws are generally universally applicable, okay? whereas uh, if you talk about uh, viscosity of a fluid as a property, every fluid has a different viscosity. And for the same fluid, it will change if you change the temperature or if you change the pressure. So you can measure the data of viscosity as a function of temperature and pressure, so you have a tabular data. So I want to describe it by a model, and that model will be a curve fitting exercise. Um, <coughs> I have a specific example that I'm going to work with. Uh, 
And today I will introduce several features of MATLAB coupled with Excel. Okay, so this course is about mathematical modeling using a variety of computational tools. Uh, we have been focusing primarily on MATLAB, but we exposed you to ISIS, for example. Today we'll see how we can take the data that comes from Excel and transport it into MATLAB and then build models, uh, curve fitting models in MATLAB. Of course, Excel also has a set of curve fitting models which are not as powerful as the ones that are in, in MATLAB. Okay. So the data that I'm going to take comes from uh, uh, Wikipedia. Okay, and this is the data for uh, water. Okay. And you can see it in Perry, you can go to NIST, National Institute of Standards and Testing, their website, and there are these data are archived and readily available. And we would need them. Okay. So this particular one is Steam Table. Have you used Steam Table? You have, right? So you know what the data that is contained in the steam table is. So temperature against pressure, that is a saturation pressure, or the liquid enthalpy, or the latent heat of vaporization, density of vapor, etc. So there are a whole range of properties that are available in the steam table. So what we are going to do is we are going to try to build a model based on the first two columns. The question that we are going to try to answer is what is the functional relationship between the saturation pressure and the temperature? Saturation pressure is what? Is the pressure at equilibrium. When water and water vapor are in equilibrium, what is the pressure exerted by the water vapor at the temperature? So at 100 degrees, for example, what should be the saturation pressure? Atmospheric pressure. Why? Because it begins to boil completely. Okay? But even at a lower temperature of 40 degrees or 30 degrees, there will be certain amount that will be in equilibrium in the vapor phase uh, with the liquid and it will be a much smaller amount. And so that pressure ex uh, temperature relationship is experimentally observed in a thermodynamic uh, uh, lab, for example. So how can we build a model? Why would we want to build a model? We would want to build a model, for example, if I'm interested in predicting what is the vapor pressure at 25 degrees at room temperature. This table gives you only at 20 degrees and 30 degrees. So if I post you that problem right now, given this tabular data, predict for me the vapor pressure at 25 degrees. How would you do that? Interpolation. Okay. So maybe this topic is familiar to you. Okay. So the inter idea of interpolation is you construct a function and then use that function to evaluate it at any other point. So if the data set that you have used to predict uh, falls within the data set that you have taken, then it is called interpolation. If it falls outside of it, it's called extrapolation. And we will see the pitfalls of extrapolation and various degrees of approximation of the interpolation. What is the simplest interpolation you had in mind? You just say it is linear. Okay. So if you take the data at 20, take the data at 30. So I, am, I want it at 25 degrees. I'm exactly at halfway point. So I d divide this 4.24 minus 2.53, divide it by 2 and add it to one end or subtract it from the other end and uh, that is my estimate of what the vapor pressure is. So if it is not at 25 degrees, if it is 26 degrees, then you do it again a proportional scaling. That will be a linear interpolation. Now if we plot the data, is it going to be linear? If it is not linear, can I use a linear interpolation and get away with it? These are the questions that we need to answer. Okay. So I have taken this data, copied this data and put it into an Excel spreadsheet. Which is, uh, I'm going to take only the first two columns for example. Okay. And um, I'm going to take it up to 100 degrees. Okay. So this is an Excel, typically in an industry you will, they use Excel a lot and the data comes in from a plant logged in online and it is automatically imported into Excel spreadsheet. So you have the data of uh, pressure in a reaction uh, vessel versus temperature at uh, various times. So you will have a tabular data like this. So the first question would be how do I get this into MATLAB if I want to do any processing in MATLAB? And uh, the Excel and MATLAB can communicate with each other and there is a, in a MATLAB there is a, a add-on feature that's called uh, Excel link. So you, you must enable that. 
and I, I hope it is enabled in most of the labs. If not, you need to go and enable it by going into this uh, options and then add-ins and under the add-in you need to search and th th there, there is a add-in called spreadsheet link with MATLAB. Check that is available. If it is available, select that and once you select that, you will have among the add-ins, when you select for example uh, from home you see this add-in, you select that and you get a set of commands on the top. Okay, And these commands allow you to do the manipulation. For example, if MATLAB is already not started, you start the MATLAB. But you can set it up such that whenever you start Excel, it automatically starts MATLAB, which is what I have done. Okay, And then put matrix. What do you think this would do? Exactly. It puts a matrix, transfers a matrix from Excel to MATLAB. And similarly, get matrix will get a variable from MATLAB and put it into the Excel spreadsheet. So these are the two important functions. And then, of course, you have evaluate string. Evaluate string would be you can put a string, which would be, for example, FSOL. FSOL for Excel will be treated as a string because it doesn't know about FSOL. But MATLAB will interpret it, evaluate it as actually a function. So you can execute a lot of MATLAB functions from within Excel, which is a very powerful because all the powers of MATLAB are now available to you within Excel. And then get figure and there are other things I haven't even explored what they are. But here I have selected two columns going from 0 degrees to 100 degrees for temperature and whatever the corresponding pressure is. I have highlighted it and then I say put that highlighted part. It says, okay, what is the variable name you want to give it? Okay. So if I say A, what do you think it will do in the MATLAB window? It will create an array, whatever, 10 or 21, in this case 11, 11 by 2, okay? So that variable is already created, so the data has been transferred. Click on that, you will actually see the data here, right? And uh, so you can now play with the data. You can create, for example, uh, T is equal to A uh, first column, comma 1. And similarly, P is equal to the second column. Okay. So I have created two more variables, P and P. Okay. Uh, in MATLAB, there are also, you can, of course, you know how to plot it. Okay. You can use the plot command, plot T comma P. Obviously, it is not a straight line, right? If all the data points were a straight line, you will get a straight line equation. But here, uh, what you're doing then is between any two data points, let me put the symbols as well. I guess I need both of them. Oops. So those are the symbols and what MATLAB has done is between those symbols it has connected by a straight line. Okay. So using this graph, you can, for example, go there and then read off if you like. Okay. Or you can fit that by a straight line, and that's what we are going to do. Put, fit that by a straight line, or a quadratic equation, or a cubic equation. MATLAB provides you tools for doing those and answering that particular question. What is the uh, vapor pressure at any temperature at values other than what is in the table? Okay. Any questions? Now, MATLAB has certain nice features which uh, you don't even need to know, for example, a lot of these commands, plot commands. If I select, for example, P and T, and there is in the workspace variable list, there is a graphical option. So it's a, by simply clicking on it, you can select what type of graph that you want to plot. For example, a simple XY graph. Of course, this is plotting uh, temperature against pressure, but you can switch them around and then plot it. Okay. What it does is it actually creates the command plot for you and then generates the graph. And the other nice feature is you can capture all these into an M file. By your, uh, so MATLAB will write the M file for you and we will explore these as we go along. Okay. But uh, this is a nice feature I just discovered recently. 
So there are various kinds of plots that are available. You can generate various kinds of plot plotting options, okay, various types of graphs, depending on it's a 2D data, 3D data, etc., without really knowing much about these commands using a GUI, graphical user interface, you can create these plots. Okay, so we know how the data looks. Okay, it is not linear. And uh, if I wanted to fit a linear equation, I can, there is a command called polyfit. What it does is it fit, fits a polynomial. It fits a polynomial to the data, uh, t comma p. And you have to give the degree of the polynomial. Now, when I say fit a polynomial, do you understand what I mean by that? How many of you don't? Okay. So, what do I need to specify as the third parameter, the degree of the polynomial. So, if I say 1, it fits a polynomial, what do you think it will return? Hmm? Now, I am asking you to kind of boldly guess what MATLAB would do and if you are wrong, you can go back and correct that. Okay? Or you can, of course, always ask for help on event. I mean, it will tell you. So, polyfit is a fitting program that fits a polynomial through a set of data points. And the first one is the independent variable, t in this case. The second one is the dependent variable. Third one is the degree of the polynomial. So, when I select a degree of a polynomial of 1, that means the equation is of the form ax plus b. Okay. So, what the polyfit will do is it will return the coefficients a and b back to me Okay, of that straight line. And it's going to be a terrible flux. Yeah. Should I switch? Switch what? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. My God, you have a good eye. <laughs> thank you very much. Polyfit. Okay, polynomial fit. So what it does is it returns two numbers, and the meaning for these numbers are these coefficients of the polynomial. So if I, I, so, I need to save this in a variable. Let me call it c1, coefficient of degree one. It's just a mnemonic for me. And then I'll create one for two, second degree polynomial, and then a third degree polynomial. And what you notice is, as the degree of the polynomial goes up, a third degree polynomial will have four constants. It will be a times uh, t cubed, b times t squared, c times t plus d. Okay? So it's a combination of those. So it returns four numbers. Okay? Now using each one of these, I can evaluate the polynomial at any other temperature that I want. But let me plot these first. Okay? Um, I have the graph, or do I have a graph? I guess not. Okay. Plot t comma p comma. Okay. Now I'm going to type a command, and I want you to kind of follow and uh, tell me what I'm trying to do. Um, What do you think I'm trying to do? Who can decide for that? Are you trying to put a polynomial C1 on that? Exactly. I'm trying to. I'm plotting. There are two curves I'm trying to generate. The first curve is simply the data points that are given, that are stored in the array T and E, using a symbol underline. Then I'm creating a vector 0 to 100 in steps of 20. And I'm evaluating the polynomial. So polyfit fits the coefficients and gives me the coefficients in C1, C2, or C3, depending on the degree of the polynomial. And then I'm evaluating that polynomial at the same independent variable range, 0 to 100 in steps of 20. Okay. Um, let me just type this. Obviously, I have an error. Uh, where is the error? Yes, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Excellent. Okay. So what this graph is, the blue graph, the blue line is the actual data point, and the green one is the polynomial fit for the data point. Obviously, if I use a first degree approximation over the whole range, I'm going to get a very poor representation of the data. And if I try to use it to interpolate, maybe I get lucky here, but if I'm trying to predict it in this range, I'll be completely off. Okay. Any questions on that? So how can I improve the accuracy? Okay. Now we're going to see the ideas behind how polyfit works and how we can improve that. And then I will sh uh, show you uh, something called CF tool, which is a built-in MATLAB tool for doing very sophisticated curve fitting of nonlinear curve fitting. So you should know and understand the difference between a linear curve fitting and a nonlinear curve fitting. Okay. So instead of doing that, if I do C2, will I get a better answer? That's not bad. Okay. So the green is still the fitted one, but it's, it's still we could do better. Okay. So you get the idea, right? So if I go for the cubic, maybe I will do even better. So how to reduce the error by simply increasing the degree of the fitting? Because you get greater degree of freedom. In a cubic polynomial, you get four degrees of freedom. Okay. So how does polyfit do conceptually? Let's talk about it and then we'll see the mathematical way of, uh, actually it is done. So you take the difference between what you predict and what is the actual value at each one of the data points. Okay. So the green line and the blue line, they don't match exactly at those data points. So you take the difference and that is your error. Okay. And you add up all the errors at every one of the data points that you have. That's your sum of errors. Square that, okay, and then minimize that. That is called the least squares method. So polyfit uses the least squares method, trying to minimize the error between its prediction and the actual data. And it finds the best value for these four coefficients, or three coefficients, or two coefficients. So when you have only two coefficients in linear polynomial, the degree of freedom that it has is not great, because it has only two constants to adjust to minimize the error. Okay, uh, whereas if you give it more degree of freedom, then it does a better job. But of course, there is another problem in increasing the degree, the degree of freedom or the degree of the polynomial, um, because very high degree of polynomials will tend to have unnecessary oscillations, and we will see examples of that. Why it gets a, a poorer um, in a later examples. Okay, any questions so far? So we have seen what is the idea behind polyfit and polyval. Polyfit fits and returns to you the coefficients of a polynomial, polyval evaluates that polynomial using the coefficients at any other location that you want. <clears throat> now I'm going to ask you a few subtler questions. Okay, So I have to, I'm going to take only three data points or four data points, 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay? And I create a new variable. Uh, T Q. Okay, and I will copy these and put it in T3. So I'm also showing you other ways of creating new variables without going into the command line. Okay, MATLAB has these nice features. And then go to the pressure and from the same location, I'll copy these and I create a new variable called P3 and I'll paste that number variables there. Okay, so I have a variable called T3 and P3 which contains four data points, pressure versus temperature. Okay, so I'm going to use that to do a fitting. Okay, now remember a cubic polynomial has how many degrees of freedom? cubic polynomial will have a linear polynomial, a straight line. A linear one, degree one polynomial has ax plus b, right? x to the power one is a linear polynomial, so ax plus b, so it has two coefficients. A quadratic x square and x, okay? So we'll have ax square plus bx plus c. So a quadratic will have three degrees of freedom. 
A cubic polynomial will have four degrees of freedom, four coefficients that polyfit has to return. Okay, and that's why I need at least four data points. Okay, so I've taken four data points and stored it in P3 and P3, and I'm saying fit a cubic polynomial, and it gives me a set of polynomials. Are these coefficients different from the one that I used previously? Will it be different? Would you expect it to be different? If I'm not making sense, please ask me to roll back and we'll build, start building up. Because when I ask a question and I see kind of blank face, I feel that I'm not getting the point across. My question to you now, I'm asking you to think is, I, I fitted a cubic polynomial, one using all the 11 data points. I have 11 data points in T and P, okay? And I fitted a cubic polynomial. And I talked about the idea of a least squares minimization that polyfit uses to find me those three coefficients, the four coefficients, okay? Then I said, I'm going to take only four data points and put a cubic through that, okay? It's going to still use a similar algorithm, um, but the degree of freedom that it has is only four, and there are only four data points. So it can only try to minimize the error at those four data points. And uh, so it gives you a different polynomial, a different set of coefficients, okay? So if I try to evaluate that, and I guess maybe I should, uh, let me call it C3 small, using a small data set, okay? I'm just making these up, okay? And then let me go back to C3 itself using the full data set. So this is C3, this is C3 small. Let me close that. Okay, they're obviously different sets of coefficients because they use different data sets, okay? One uses only four, the other one uses all the 11, okay? Now, I'm going to evaluate the value of the saturation pressure at a certain temperatures. And what are those temperatures? They're going to be T3, okay? So poly, well, C3S comma T3. What would I expect as the value? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to predict what are the saturation pressures at those temperatures that are contained in T3. These are 10, 20, 30, and 40 degrees, okay? So let me do that. And what is P3? What do you see? The actual values of the saturation pressures are 1.227, 2.536, etc. But polyfit also predicts exactly the same values. There is a very subtle point here. This is for the final exam. These subtle points will be explored, okay? So when you are using the number of data points that fits with the degree of the polynomial, in this case, cubic with four data points, the, the, the fit will pass exactly through those data points. So there is no error at those locations. But of course, any other position that you evaluate, there will be error. For example, if I want to evaluate uh, at... Uh, Instead of a 10, 20, I'm doing it, say, 15, 25 at these two locations. From the four data set point, that is using a cubic passing through four data points, and then I do the same thing with the full cubic over 0 to 400, uh, 200, okay? And I get completely different answers. The idea of exploring all these, you may probably have to go back and uh, replay this again and think about it is for you to actually think and understand what, what is curve fitting and what are we doing with these uh, algorithms. Because you can really abuse it and get nonsensical results. So the graph of just four data points, is it going to be the same, basically the same line as the graph of all between those points as the main graph? No, no, good question. You have to keep asking those questions and play with it. The question is, will the graph of those four data points be the same as the graph for the full 11 data points. Yeah, within, like, within that range, it will exactly be the same okay. because we are using the same data points, okay? But the curve that we, maybe let's plot both these curves, okay? So plot um, T comma P comma, I hope I get the right symbol. So I'm plotting the basic data points given over the entire range, zero to 100 degrees. I'm also going to plot those four data points, they have to be exactly the same because I extracted from there, okay? So T3 comma P3 comma plus 
Okay. And then let me plot the graph that passes through those four data points and the graph that passes through the 11 data points to see how they compare. So how would I plot this? The four data points would be T3, comma, poly, well, what should I put? So that says using the coefficients for the four data set points, which is stored in C3S, evaluate this polynomial at T3. Okay. And uh, in fact, I might actually evaluate it over the whole range so that it's to see how it plots that. Okay. Uh, so I should actually plot it then T. Okay. And then let me add and let me use a particular symbol for this. What do we want to use? Uh, star one. I guess there is an error there. Star. Okay. Oops, it doesn't accept that. Okay, let me just put star for this. Maybe star is the problem. <laughs> uh, what other symbols are there? Mm. Okay, let me change the color. Green. Fine. Ah, the error is because of the because not because of the star, because of the comma there. Okay, so the, there are three curves we have added now. The first curve is data points, original data point from uh, eleven data points. The next one is the three data point, the four data points for the cubic polynomial. The third curve, uh, curve is the fitted polynomial using the shorter data set. And the fourth one that I'm going to add is polyval C three comma t comma star dash. Any questions on that long statement? Let's look at that curve. So what do you see? What do you understand? What do you interpret from that? W what do you think is that green line there? I specifically put G for the polynomial that uses the four data points. Okay, here is the G, right? And all the data points do a good job in the range of 0 to 40. They're all doing well. Why? Because I use this data set in both of them. Okay, in the large curve, it goes from 0 to 100, another one that goes to 10 to 40. So they do a good job. But the one that I've used for 10 to 40 becomes worse as you go farther away from it. That would be called an extrapolation. extrapolation, exactly. Okay? So it is dangerous to extrapolate outside of the range. So if you fit within this, then you are okay to use it within this. That would be the extrapolation, and it will do a good job. Okay? If you want to use it somewhere here, then either use the data point from that point or use the data point from the range. Okay? But it is dangerous to extrapolate far away. Because the cubic, if you fit it here, the parts might have left. Because that cubic didn't have any data about these points. We use only these data points. Okay. So is that clear? That's a very good question that you asked. So you need to kind of play with it, ask these questions, and that's how you can get them resolved and answered in your own mind. Okay. So in the case where we used all the 11 data points, that is the red curve, for example, we are using least squares curve fitting because we have only four degrees of freedom, but we have 11 data points. So we try to minimize. But in the case where we had only exactly four data points, it is passing through exactly those four data points. Outside of that, the error is likely to be much larger. It's not minimizing the error. Okay. Any other questions? So this is just to give you a kind of a motivation of what kind of problem is useful, typically for interpolation of tabular data is one use. The other use, of course, is fitting more complicated functions, and we will see that. And uh, of course, solving differential equations, the same idea extends also when you like, understand it in a more abstract way as functional approximation. 
<coughs> here it's a functional approximation for a data set. But you can also have the same thing for solving differential equations, as we will see later. Okay. So if there are no questions, let's go back and uh, start reviewing the theory behind it. Um, so as I said, there are two types of problems in functional approximation in a more uh, basic uh, abstract way. One is, given a function f of x that looks very complicated, how can I construct a simpler representation of that function, a polynomial representation? Okay, And the second one is given a data set, which is what we saw as an example. Given a data set, often from experiments, how do I represent it by a function so that I can use the function to predict at other data points that are not in the table. So it is either an interpolation problem or an extrapolation problem. And we already used the steam table as an example. But let me use uh, another example of approximating a complicated function. This is a function that I would be surprised if you have heard of it. Have, have you heard of error function? Yeah. You have. In what context? In materials. In, materials. in heat transfer, <laughs> you would come across this. In transient heat transfer um, and in a few other mass transfer courses, you will come across this because error function is a solution to a partial differential equation that models transient heat transfer and transient mass transfer. So it would also appear in other areas like material science. But it appears as a solution to a differential equation. So if you've done a differential equation, you might have seen that. Uh, we have already seen polyval and polyfit, but we need to see does MATLAB know what the error function is. What is the definition of an error function? The definition of an error function is it's an integral from 0 to x e to the power minus psi squared d psi. Essentially what it is is, I don't know what the integral is, so I'm going to name it as a function, new function. Okay. And that's what mathematicians do. Mathematicians look at differential equations and say, okay, this differential equation has a series solution and I'm going to give it a new name. So Bessel function, Legendre functions. There are many, many such functions that are solutions to differential equations that have special names and hence a special representation so we can evaluate it. If I want to calculate, for example, error function at point one, MATLAB will know how to do it. Okay, But the basic definition is it is, I think there's probably a 2 there, 2 over square root of pi, I think. We'll verify that, okay? Integral of 0 to x e to the power minus i squared d psi. You know what is the integral of e to the minus x? It's e to the minus x itself. The derivative of e to the mi minus x is e to the minus x itself with the minus sign, sign flipping over, okay? But psi squared makes it impossible to integrate. So there is no closed form analytical expression for that integral. So we'll just leave it as it is. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to introduce you to another tool. Again, have you seen symbolic processing in the course, differential equation course? What is symbolic processing? Taking derivatives, taking integrals with a computer. You have not seen that. Okay, so MATLAB has another built-in powerful tool called MuPad, and it is very much like Maple, Mathematica, or MathCAD. These are all tools that provide similar functionality. The functionality is it understands symbolic manipulation. You can actually say, take the derivative of sine of x, it will know it as cos of x. Otherwise, most of the computers are very good in doing numerical processing, dealing with numbers. MATLAB started as a program that dealt mostly with numerical processing. Okay, But they added a toolbox called the symbolic toolbox and that will be able to do symbolic processing and I will show you what that is pretty soon. Okay. Uh, can I close MATLAB? Yes, I did. So one of the things we want to learn is does MATLAB know about error function? Can I evaluate the error function? Can I then do polynomial curve fitting? by evaluating the error function at different locations as we explore this idea of curve fitting. Okay, so does it know error function? So I'm going to say evaluate error function at 0.5 for me. Says. So this is just like saying sine of uh, 0.3. It calculates it. So in the same way, ERF, the error function at any location, 
it'll just calculate. For example, if I want to calculate it at 5, let's say since point, um, sorry, not sign, I want an error function at 5 is 1. So I can create a vector, for example, x0 to in steps of point 1 to 10, and then y is error function of x. So error function takes a vector as input and produces the corresponding y values, and then I say plot x comma y. Oops. Thank you. X comma y. That is the error function. So if you want to look at what is the shape of the function, starts at 0, goes to 1, around a value of 2, and then it just remains at 1. Okay, so error function, this particular function will satisfy a differential equation as a solution. Okay. So MATLAB knows about error function, but does it know about um, that integral that we talked about? Okay. So I'm going to start MuPad. MuPad. If you type MuPad under MATLAB prompt, it starts the symbolic processing toolbox. It opens up a separate window, and from that point on, you can actually do differentiation, integration, etc. So it gives you, for example, these symbols here. Okay. So that that means take a derivative of a function or take the integral of a function. Okay. So for, for example, if I say if I click that, it puts me the command diff is the function that takes the derivative and the placeholder I can put for example sine of x and then I say take the derivative with respect to x. Again, it's the same idea of a function, function with input arguments. So diff is a function it knows how to take the derivative of analytical expressions. So if I say derivative of sine of x with respect to x, it says it's cos x. If I say derivative of sine of x squared with respect to x, it says it's 2x cos x squared. Okay? It's really a very powerful tool for handling numerical, uh, I mean, uh, analytical integration and de uh, derivatives. So let's go back to the notes and explore what this error function is. Okay. So the error function is integral of e to the power minus psi squared d psi. Okay. So here I have the commands for you to play with, but uh, let me okay. So I say integral of uh, exponential of minus x with respect to x. Okay, So I'm saying do the integration with respect to e to the minus x. And it says minus 1 over e to the x or minus e to the power minus x. But when I change that to x squared, which is what the error function is based on, it immediately tells me that it is error function of x multiplied by 2 over square root of 5. So the 2 over square root of pi is a normalizing condition that makes the error function go to from 0 to 1. Okay. So if I had done, for example, 2 divided by square root of pi multiplied by that, then that will be error function. So the mu pad knows symbolically what the error function is. Here x is a symbol. x doesn't have any number, any particular value. Okay. So when you go into mu pad, you are processing symbols. You are able to take differentiation, integration, etc. Okay, but MATLAB from the MATLAB command window, you cannot do the same thing because MATLAB when I say error function of x, it expects a number, not a symbol. Okay, so x must be defined before. For example, let's say clear all the workspace e r f x. It will say undefined variable x, but if I define x as 0.5 or and then error function, it can evaluate it. Whereas the mu pad can evaluate symbols and uh, derivatives of symbols, etc. Any questions? Have you seen this symbolic processing? No? Okay. Where would it be useful? Let's see whether anybody can. If I give you an assignment that involves uh, Newton method, you need to take all the partial derivatives of every variable. The Jacobian, exactly, exactly. That's what I want you to kind of link. So here we have seen a new powerful tool which takes the derivatives. And where do I need to take a derivative? In building the Jacobian matrix, for example. 
Okay. So if you can call mu paired and pass the function and say take its derivative, give it back to me, and use that to evaluate the Jacobian, you have really done well in integrating and combining various parts of these tools. So you should be able to use Excel with MATLAB, MuPad with MATLAB, even Aspen Hisis as links to Excel uh, that you could uh, use, use to transfer the data. Okay. All right. So let's go back to So we already did this. We created a set of data points and plotted the error function. Now, remember, our goal is to, and I showed you this graph, our goal is to do a curve fitting of the complicated error function with a polynomial. Okay. <coughs> the error function has an infinite series expansion. So we're going to introduce certain concepts of truncation errors. We already know what round off error is. Do you remember what a round off error is? No, that could be in the midterm exam. <laughs> the round off error is the error introduced by rounding off numbers. If I have, for example, 1 over 3, how does MATLAB do 1 over 3? It's an important concept, okay? 1 divided by 3. What is 1 divided by 3? 0.3333 three, 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 forever. If you go format long, and do the same thing. MATLAB can take only up to 15, 16 digits precision, double precision. Okay, that is, it uses eight bytes to represent numbers. So this number continues on, but you are rounding it off. Okay, at the 15th or 16th decimal place, and that introduces an error in the number representation. So if you're doing products of numbers that are rounded off, that error can accumulate, particularly when you're inverting a large matrix, for example. Okay, so that concept of a round off error is a source of error in computational simulation is an important one for you to understand. The other one is called the truncation error, and that's what we are going to see now. Okay. So this error function has an infinite series representation. Okay, so what is error function? One definition is the, as the integral of e to the power of minus i squared d psi, but e to the power of minus i squared itself can be represented as an infinite series that is given here. What is e to the power x? If I ask you this, what is e to the power x? It is an infinite series, right? And that series is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc. It just goes on. Okay, what is sine x? That has an infinite series representation. What is cos x? Every one of these functions has a series representation, which is what is used in your calculator, for example. When you're calculating e to the power 2, what it does is it comes here and takes enough terms in the series to give you the desired accuracy. Okay, and then truncates the series. And that is called a truncation error. The error introduced by neglecting higher terms from an infinite series would be your truncation error. So this is actually a series that goes from k equal to 0 to infinity. Okay, And because I have psi square, I have x to the power 2k. So this is essentially e to the power x, but wherever I have x, I've replaced it by x square. Okay, And there is a minus sign, so it is minus plus, it alternates. Okay, So do you understand this series? Any questions on that? I've noticed one thing, whenever we are doing practical problems, there is a lot of interest and you guys are following, but whenever we drift into some theoretical stuff, I don't see the same level of excitement. I don't know what to do to keep that up. Only a few that, um, th th there are some studies that classify people uh, into analytical and uh, intuitive, okay? But majority of us, including me, tend to be the intuitive side. Very few are analytical side. I don't know that I've given you this kind of a funny quiz. Um, let me try that. Um, I need a volunteer. Who among you consider yourself as an analytical person? Are you ready to play the game with me? <laughs> uh, pretend to be, whatever it is. I, I, I pretended for a long time. And I realized when somebody gave me this quiz, I realized, oh my God, I'm not analytical. <laughs> it's, it's a game. It's a game that we play. 
Okay, and I want all of you to play this game in your own mind. Okay, in your own mind's eye, but not loud. I want only one person to play with me loud. Okay, and the way that we are going to play this game is I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer the question spontaneously without waiting for it, without analyzing it. Okay, and it's going to be very simple. For example, I will say, How do you pronounce B O O K? You would say book, right? And that's that's the kind of a <laughs> silly test it is. Okay, uh, are, is everybody ready? Are you ready? Okay. Um, how do you pronounce H O P? How do you pronounce S H O P? What do you do at a green traffic light? How many of you said the same thing? I said the same thing. The question was, what do you do at a green traffic light? And you said stop, right? And I said the same thing. So what what does the mind do? It's, I set up your thinking process. You say hop, shop, and the next thing that comes to your mind is stop. <laughs> right? You don't you're not analytical enough to kind of think quickly and say information is different, right? So there are a lot of studies like this that try to understand how brain works. Okay, so I, I think that's probably what the cause is for you to drift away, and this is an attempt to try to bring you back. <laughs> Okay, so this infinite series, getting back to go back and play with your <laughs> uh, family, and uh, it's a fun uh, game. Okay, so e to the power x has an infinite series, and so e to the power x square has this particular series. I make sure that you understand. Okay, all we are doing is applying the same definition of e to the power x, replacing x by minus psi square. So I get a minus one to the power k, x to the power two k. The two comes from the fact that it's a psi square. Okay, so I can take this definition of the infinite series for e to the power minus psi square, put it into the <coughs> error function definition, and integrate every term, term by term. And when I do that, I will get an infinite series representation for e to the power minus, uh, sorry, the error function at x. Okay, so this is an infinite series. Once again, I need to truncate it. MATLAB does exactly that. When I say error function at 0.5, it will go and set up the while loop. And we have seen an example of this <coughs> in the uh, very first MATLAB tutorial. Okay, so take enough terms and decide when the next term is smaller than a tolerance, 10 to the minus 12 or 10 to the minus 14, and then stop. And that idea is called the truncation error. The error introduced by chopping off at a certain number of terms from an infinite uh, series or even a polynomial with a large number of terms. If you truncate it with a fewer terms, you incur some error in that representation. And that is what we are representing as the polynomial. So P is a polynomial here, and the subscript here refers to the degree of the polynomial. 2n plus 1 says the degree of the polynomial is 2n plus 1. N could be any number here. So if I take, for example, n as 1, I'm going to truncate that series after just one term. And when I do that, I get a polynomial of BDP. Okay, that is the term will have x cubed. Okay, so an infinite series is truncated to a finite polynomial of a finite degree, and the degree of the polynomial is indicated as a subscript here, and that is the same as that term, and that is determined by how many terms I choose to write in that expansion, and that introduces a truncation error. <laughs> So whatever is left, I call that as a truncation error. Okay. <clears throat> I need to keep this truncation error idea in my mind because when I'm trying to approximate a given set of data or a function by a functional approximation, I should know which functional approximation is more accurate. Okay. That kind of thing you should be able to do in an exam. I give you three different formula and say which one is more accurate. You should be able to tell me by knowing something about this truncation error. So the idea of a truncation error is terms that are left off by truncating a large series. And 2n plus 1 here represents the degree of the polynomial. So it's an approximation. This symbol says that the error function is approximated by a polynomial of degree 2n plus 1. Any questions on that? No? <coughs> So here I have done the same kind of playing with the MATLAB that we did before with the steam table. So I've taken two terms, four terms, six terms, eight terms, 10 terms, 12, 20 terms, 
from that series, the infinite series. And <laughs> I have evaluated that error function at 0.5 and at 1. Okay. So this table is constructed to compare against the exact value. What does the exact value mean in this case? Can I calculate an exact value? Obviously not, because I need to calculate infinite number of terms, and I will need to carry infinite number of digits, which is not realistic. Okay? <coughs> Even though, for example, pi, people have computed up to million digits. There are algorithms that are ways of calculating pi. Similarly, these functions could be calculated to any degree of precision that we want, but I've just, when I say exact, I mean within the MATLAB context, up to 16 digits accuracy. Okay, that I can calculate. So if I truncate it with two digits, for example, I get point, uh, 0.5207 at x equal to 0.5. And the exact number is this. But if I increase the degree of the approximation, what do I get? From this table, let me ask you the question. What would you conclude? How many terms do you need to calculate the error function accurately at 0.5? <coughs> <coughs> four, two terms, fourth degree polynomial is good enough to give you 0 0.5205, which is the exact value. Okay, But if I go farther away to 1, then I need, this is the exact value. There is some error. The error is not caused by round off error. The error is caused by truncating the series only to two terms. So if I take four terms, it gets better. If I take six terms, it gets better. But any additional term doesn't make it better. Why? Why doesn't taking, for example, eight terms? Six terms, I get 0.842701, which is the same as the exact one. I take eight terms, I get the same result, 0 0.842701. Why? Pardon me? The changes are further to the right, exactly. Okay. So if you go back in the series and ask the question, what is it, what is it I'm asking? Okay. So I'm saying I did expand this using two terms, I get a wrong number, and then I add, and I put three, I take the next term. I add it, and it still is significant. And when I take the next term, then it's going to be 0 0.000004 or something like this. Okay, so it is already accurate to five decimal places. So by taking additional terms, I don't improve the accuracy. If the accuracy I want is only to five significant digits or six significant digits. Pardon me. You are increasing the accuracy in the seventh or eighth decimal place. There is still change taking place in the seventh or eighth decimal place that will be given by the 10 term expansion. And if you take 20 term expansion, the changes will be taking place in the 24th decimal place, for example. MATLAB is not even capable of calculating that. You can calculate only up to 16 digits. So what happens is the higher order terms become very small. Why do they become small? You can ask that question. Why does it become small? Why do that? These are the, exactly the same terms, except k becomes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. And I'm taking x to the power 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Right? So if x is less than 1, what would happen? If x is less than 1 and I'm squaring it, cubing it, etc., it's going to be smaller and smaller, right? 0.9 times 0.9 is 0 0.81. 0 0.81 times 0 0.81 would be 0 0.64, something like that. So if a number is less than 1, by taking its power, you are lowering its value. That's one process. So that t tells you that farther away from 0, you are going to take longer multiplication to make it small. And that is what we see in the table here. For 0.5, it converges much more quickly than in, at 1. Okay, You need more terms at 1 than at 0.5. And that is clearly visible by looking and understanding this particular function. The second reason that it becomes smaller is the factorial. What happens to k factorial? It gets very big very quickly. Right? And it is in the denominator. right? And that's what makes the series convergent. Okay? 
When I say the series is convergent, it means the higher and higher order terms get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. <coughs> so, you should understand the idea of what a truncation error is. Why does it become small? Okay. Uh, for a given, it need not be true for all series. For this particular series, that happens. Okay. And when, once you understand that, you understand what is happening in this table. So, for example, at x equal to 2, you are taking x to the power 2, x to the power 3, x to the power 4, etc. That's going to become larger and larger. But the denominator has k factorial. That's going to try to bring it smaller and smaller. So, you actually need about 20 terms before you agree with the exact result to six decimal places. So, you need to take 20 terms. The farther you are away, the more terms that you need to take. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? No? So we are going to define an idea of an error, a truncation error. Error is <coughs> defined as the actual function minus the approximate function, what the approximate function predicts. In this case, it's a polynomial. Absolute value of that. And that error is going to depend from this table we have understood that it is going to depend on where you evaluate that function. If you are closer to zero, this error is going to be smaller. If you go farther away from zero, it's going to be larger. And by taking more terms, we can bring it down. But taking fewer terms, the error goes up. Okay. <coughs> So, we have played with error function so far and we want to generalize this to any function. If you give me any arbitrary function, can I represent that as a polynomial representation? Okay, And that is represented by this expression. The idea behind this is you give me the function f of x, I need to be able to build a polynomial of certain degree n that represents as closely as possible to the function f of x. And that polynomial can be written in terms of the series that you see, k from 1 to n, a i phi i. Phi i are called basis functions. Have you seen the idea of a basis function, basis vectors before? No? Basis vectors? Okay. <coughs> the idea of a basis function or a basis vector is it provides a framework using which you can construct any other vector or any other function. Maybe let's review this vector. I'm sure you've seen this in linear algebra in the vector concept, but maybe not for functions. Okay. <clears throat> what do we mean by a basis vector? Suppose in, in, in two dimensions. Okay. This is x1, this is x2. And you can generalize this to any n dimension. Okay. So I have two coordinates, x1 and x2. And in each direction, I specify a unit vector i1 and a unit vector i2. You've seen this idea, right? What a unit vector is. So what we are saying in a vector space is, if you give me any point p, that point p can be represented as a linear combination of these basis vectors. That means I can write p as a vector as i1 x1 plus i2 x2. What does it mean? It simply means in the x1 direction that i1 says, i1 points the direction, one unit in the x1 direction. So in the x1 direction, go a distance of x1. Okay, And then go in a perpendicular direction i2, a distance of x2 to reach that point p. Okay, That means I'm going to go along this and then go along that. <clears throat> and so this distance is going to be x1 and that distance is going to be x2. So this point P is given by the coordinate distance x1, x2. So if, I, if you give me the coordinates x1, x2, I can locate where P is. But I can also write it in a symbolic way as i1, x1 plus i2, x2. What is i1? i1, as I said, is a unit vector. So i1 is going to be 1 and 0. That means it has a unit of 1 in the first direction and 0 in the second direction. There's no component in the x2 direction. Similarly, i2 will be what? 0 and 1. With this definition, if you tell me x1 and x2, I can actually plug i1 there, x1 there, i2 there, x2 there, carry out the product and get the coordinates x1, x2. 
as the position vector, that position vector P, represented by a vector like this, starting from the origin. So this idea tells you that any vector in an n-dimensional space can be written as a combination of basis vectors, and the, these are the basis vectors, and the actual fun, uh, the vector values, component values. The same idea applies to functions. Okay, So you have an arbitrary function f, if I know the basis function, so the basis function must be known, just like the basis vectors are known here, 1 and 0 and 0 and 1. The same way basis functions are known functions. If I take those functions and I make a linear combination of all those basis functions, I can represent any arbitrary function. That's the idea. Okay, But if you want a geometrical interpretation of that, I've given you one for the vectors, but for the functions, what does it mean? For the function, for example, this is x and this is f of x. And this is some arbitrary function, f of x, that is given to me. And I want to construct that arbitrary function as a linear combination of basis functions. What are the basis functions? I could take one, x, x squared, x cubed, as my basis set. So when I do that, what I'm saying is I'm going to take one, and I'm going to take x, I'm going to take x squared maybe. So I'm taking these elementary functions, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x, x to the power 4, these are the polynomial basis set if you like. Okay, And I'm going to multiply that by some unknown factors and add them up. And I need to see how I can add these up to match with that function. By making a linear combination of these constant linear quadratic functions, adding them up by how, what amount should I add to produce that given function f of x? That's the question I'm trying to answer. Okay, And so that means I need to find these values of a, a1, a2, a3, a4, such that when I add all these up, it matches up with this function. That is the exercise of curve fitting, which is what we do. Polyfit does exactly that. It takes, uh, as your basis set, 1x, x squared, x cubed, it constructs the polynomial and asks what should be these coefficients of these polynomials in such a way that function represents the given function as accurately as possible or a data as accurately as possible. Okay, So it's an abstract way of introducing the idea of a curve fitting. Question? They are not eigenvalues. They are just coefficients of these polynomials. Okay, Eigenvalues are different beasts that we will talk about maybe later on. Okay. Uh, but these are not eigenvalues. These are coefficients, a vector of coefficients multiplied by a set of functions. Let me maybe again digress a bit uh, and explore some fun part. How many of you are musicians here? Only one. Okay. What instrument do you play? What instrument do you play? Guitar. Okay. <clears throat> but we have all listened to music, right? So these days you have digital synthesizers. The question that we are going to address or try to understand is you can ask what is the relationship that to the functional approximation. I'll come back and tell you that. Okay. Um, when I hear a note C from a guitar and uh, some from a violin or from a piano, I can be in another room and I can tell, oh, this guy is playing the guitar or it's the same note for 440 hertz. From an engineering point of view, it has a certain frequency, we can analyze it, right? It's the same note. But sitting in the next room, not watching, I can tell this sound is coming from a guitar, this one is coming from piano, this one is coming from violin. What is it that allows me to do that? Shape of sound waves. Shape of sound waves. We have a theoretical musician here, <laughs> not only a practical person. What do we mean by the shape of a sound wave? If you sample the sound with a mic and put it on an oscilloscope, you will see what is the actual waveform produced by guitar. And you will get, for example, <coughs> If you plot it as a function of time, you, you might get something like this. So it will have 440 hertz as the fundamental frequency, but it will have a specific shape that is unique to that particular instrument. Okay, And this is a Fourier series. Have you seen Fourier series? No? Fourier series for, uh, is a series that tries to construct an ap approximation for an arbitrary periodic function in terms of sines and cosines. The idea is not very difficult to follow. So if you give me a complicated waveform like that, I can take, for example, a sine wave, 
with 440 hertz. Now, if I produce a sine wave, this you could properly do it in MATLAB, okay. You can produce a sine function, obviously, and feed that to the speaker in the computer itself, 440 hertz. It will produce the same tone, but it will be boring, right? It will just make one sound. What is it? Why, why is it violin more different and beautiful or guitar because of its higher harmonics, okay? And what that means is if you sample that, if you want to construct this arbitrary waveform produced by a guitar, you take that basic waveform and then add the higher harmonics. The higher harmonics are twice the frequency, 2 times 440, 3 times 440, 4 times 440, etc. So that's an infinite sine series. Geometrically, what it means is I'm going to take the next function, which has double the frequency, and I'm going to add these two, the basic frequency and the higher frequency, in certain proportions. So I'm going to write this as f of x as equal to summation of a i sine omega i t. Omega i is the frequency. Okay. So I'm going to take sine functions of various frequencies and find the weighting factors for each one of them and add them up in such a way that approximation comes close to this. And digital synthesizers basically use these principles. So the same keyboard can produce the sound of a flute or a guitar or uh, a piano. How? Because it is digitally synthesized. They sample the sound, they break it down into the Fourier coefficients, and they store only the Fourier coefficients. So when you say flute, it gets a bunch of Fourier coefficients, puts the sine waves, adds them together, and it sounds like a flute. Okay? And the idea is you can represent any arbitrary waveform as a linear combination of set of basis functions. In the case of a Fourier series, those basis functions are sines and cosines of various frequencies. Generalize that idea to any arbitrary function, that's what we have here. Okay, So you can take any arbitrary function f of x, select a basis set, need not be just Fourier series, could be just polynomial set, and then weight as a linear combination. And then try to pose the problem as one where I need to find out what are those coefficients, such that the right hand side of the series, a finite series, represents the left hand side as accurately as possible. Any questions? Does it make sense, this idea of a basis set? No? So now building on this idea, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to take my basis set given by this, what I said exactly when i equal to 1, x to the power i minus 1 is x to the power 0, which is 1. So the basis set, if I have to write it expanded as it's going to be 1x, x square, x cube, etc. So I decide how many terms, that determines the degree of the polynomial. So that is a polynomial representation for an approximation. And in this polynomial approximation, I have finite number of terms, and the degree of the polynomial is n minus 1. And these coefficients are the unknowns I need to find out. That is the problem that is solved by polyfit. So give polyfit a set of data or a function. It constructs this basis set. The basis set for polyfit is always 1x x squared x cubed from coming from a polynomial set. Okay. So that is the theory behind what polyfit does. So it is part of it, setting up the problem. <coughs> <clears throat> so, building on this, I have this error function, okay, and I want to construct an approximation for the error function over this interval. And this kind of a thing you should be able to do in an exam, a post final exam. Now we are talking about this is not included in the midterm, okay. So, I'm going to pose you a problem and give you a function and I say construct a polynomial representation of degree 2 or degree 3. That means you need to go through the process of assembling the matrix and setting it up for solving. You don't have to solve it uh, because you won't have MATLAB in an exam. Okay? So here we have said, I'm going to take four terms in a polynomial representation. So the basis set is 1x x squared x cubed. My polynomial of degree 3 is a1 plus a2x plus a3x squared plus a4x cubed. And my job is to find out the best values for a1, a2, a3, a4, such that this polynomial is as good as the error function in that range of 0.1 to 0.5. Have I posed the problem clearly now? Do you understand what needs to be done? 
I give you a data set or I give you a function and I say construct a polynomial of certain degree and that means you need to find the best values of these coefficients in that polynomial. If you have polyfit, you can actually do it easily, but in an exam, you need to set up how polyfit solves for this problem. <coughs> okay, so we have four degrees of freedom. That means A1, A2, A3, A4. We are free to choose those four numbers in such a way that this polynomial gets as good as the error function in that range. That is the job. Okay. So how can we do that? Because we have four degrees of freedom, we say I'm going to divide my interval into four. Okay. So when you see something like this, does it make sense? What am I trying to do there? I'm trying to evaluate that error function at four locations. Okay. So I've written it in general for any n. Okay. And these are called collocation points. Okay. These are the points. Graphically, if I have to represent this, I have error function of x and the range is 0.1 to 0.5 in x. So 0.1 is a data point, 0.5 is a data point. If I'm dealing with a third degree polynomial, I need four numbers. So I'm going to choose the two additional numbers at equal intervals. So I take the whole interval, divide that into equal number of parts and make sure that I have enough data points. So if I say do a fifth degree polynomial, you need to have six data points. So you will pick four more in between, the two endpoints being the points that are always fixed. Okay, And that's what this formula allows you to calculate. Okay, x1 is equal to a, always at the left boundary, x2, xn equal to b, always at the right boundary, but you select x2, x3, xn minus 1 in such a way that you have equally spaced data points as many data points as the degree of the polynomial, plus one, because if it's a third degree polynomial, you'll have four unknowns, okay? So third degree polynomial, you have four unknowns here. And then evaluate that function at each one of those points. So you get only four data points. And then try to minimize the error. So the error is defined as the difference between the actual function and the polynomial representation make that error equal to zero exactly at those four data points and solve for A. In this class, what I want you to do is make sure that you understand the posing of the problem. We have posed the problem, developed the idea to the step where we will have four equations in four unknowns. The four unknowns are A1, A2, A3, A4. What are the four equations? The four equations are this polynomial evaluated at those four data points. Okay, and in the next class we'll come back and continue from here and set up the matrix as P A equal to F, and then how to solve that matrix. We will see that. Okay. <clears throat>